Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ezekiel Dixon Roman, and welcome to the School Social Policy and Practices Speaker Series on Control Societies, Technocratic Forces, and Ontologies of Difference. This speaker series is supported by a Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund grant, the Price Lab for Digital Humanities, and the School Social Policy and Practice. Today's talk is the last installment of the speaker series, and uh, we have had a stellar lineup of speakers this year. Um, although we are rounding out our speaker series today, each of the talks were videoed, with the exception of the first one with um, Alex Monet, and are available online at criticalpolicystudies.com. So if you did not make some of the previous ones, you can definitely come check, go, to, go online and check them out online. So um, again, it's criticalpolicystudies.com. That said, uh, this afternoon, I am super excited to have Rob Kitchen join us digitally from across the Atlantic. Um, in fact, it's literally like 9.05 there right now. Is that right, Rob? Yep. <laughs> um, so we're, we're very appreciative and, and gracious for the, the fact that you're willing to join us um, uh, so late. Um, Rob Kitchen is professor and ERC advanced investigator at the National University of Ireland, Manu. He is co-principal investigator of the Programmable City Project, the Building City Dashboards Project, the All Island Research Observatory, and the Digital Repository of Ireland. He has published widely across the social sciences, including 23 authored slash edited books and over 150 articles and book chapters. He was the editor in chief of the 12 volume International Encyclopedia of Human Geography and is presently editor of the journal Dialogues in Human Geography. He was a 2003 recipient of the Royal Irish Academy's gold medal for the social sciences. His most recent, uh, his more recent book, The Data Revolution, Big Data, Open Data, Data Infrastructures and Their Consequences, is a tour de force, developing a philosophy of science on data, conceptualizing data as assemblages of multiple forces, including, though not limited to, policy and legal context, sociocultural pol uh, processes, political economy, and subjectivities. In our era of the information age and big data, I would argue it is a critically important text to read and be on top of. Um, his talk today is titled The Ethics and Risks of Smart Cities and Urban Big Data. And without further ado, I'm turn it over to Rob Kitchen. Well, it's okay. Thanks very much for the uh, invitation for talk and for facilitating me uh, doing this uh, virtually rather than uh, flying across the Atlantic. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, what I'm going to talk about is the uh, ethics and risks of uh, smart cities and, uh, and urban big data. And if you're not uh, familiar with smart cities, I'll give you a brief introduction and tell you about some of the kinds of data that they're producing and the, the various uh, risks uh, uh, around that. So uh, there's lots of different definitions of what a smart city is. Uh, generally encompasses three uh, main dynamics. Uh, the first one is a regulation and efficiency. So this is uh, cities being composed of what we might call everywhere uh, with uh, ICT infrastructures, devices, sensors, meters, uh, being pro processing with software and producing uh, big data. And this is the idea that cities become networked, programmable uh, and data driven and thus knowable and controllable in new dynamic and uh, reactive ways. The second one is around um, economic development. So this is advances in ICT to reconfigure the economy uh, introduce new forms of creativity, innovation, education, sustainability, uh, and so on. And it uh, links into the idea of cities being competitive, entrepreneurial, uh, and knowledge-driven. And the last uh, kind of component is around social innovation and civic engagement. So this is ICT as a, as a means for accountable governance, new forms of civic participation, uh, new ways to solve lo local issues, and citizen-centric uh, tools. So this is Cities are shared, open, transparent, enabling, uh, and, and empowering. And in reality, most cities around the world are doing a combination of all three of those, but they're doing them in uh, a kind of very, uh, variously blended uh, ways. So these are the kinds of uh, smart city technologies that I'm talking about that have been introduced, and they're being introduced across a number of different uh, domains. So. Uh, so in relation to governments, uh, there's new forms of kind of city operating systems, performance management systems, urban uh, dashboards in relation to security, emergency uh, services, there's uh, 
uh, things like centralized control rooms, digital surveillance, predictive policing, co coordinated emergency response, in transport, there's intelligent transport systems, smart travel cards, uh, real-time passenger information, smart parking, uh, logistics management software, and so on. Into energy, we're talking about things like smart grids, smart meters, energy uses apps, uh, smart lighting, into waste around compactor bins, dynamic routing uh, and collection of waste, into environment around things like sensor networks, so uh, sensors that collect pollution, noise, of uh, weather data, land movement, flood management, uh, and so on, into buildings and building management systems, into your home, into smart meters, into app controlled appliances, and into the civic realm around various kinds of apps, uh, open data, volunteered uh, data, uh, and, uh, and hackathons, uh, and so on. And all of those uh, different technologies are producing vast quantities of what we call urban big data. So this is a uh, kind of real time data. So it's produced uh, uh, in, uh, with a high velocity. So in real time, it tends to be exhaustive. So it's exhaustive to a, to a system. So if you're using an automatic number plate recognition camera, it's not just uh, scanning a sample of cars, it's scanning every single car on the, on the road. If you're looking at Twitter location, uh, based uh, tweets, it's 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 a uh, every single tweet that's uh, got a geolocation, not not a sample, and so on. So they they tend to be kind of exhaustive in how they collect their how they collect their data, and they're, and they're being generated in lots of different ways. Obviously, so this the system, some of these systems are still uh, human in and on the loop, so people are still involved in in the process of intervening and so on. Some of it's uh, automated. Uh, and some of it's volunteered where we, we give our information up into social media by wearing wearables, by uh, doing crowdsourcing projects like OpenStreetMap or uh, Wikipedia and so on, into citizen science projects. So, you know, you might have a weather station in your back uh, garden and it's uploading the data into Wonderground and is being used for kind of alternative uh, weather data production. And what it means is that we now have a kind of a diverse range of public and private um, entities who are generating fine-scale data about citizens and places uh, in real time. And this includes things like utility companies, transport providers, environmental agencies, mobile phone operators, app developers on your, uh, so the apps on your phone, social media sites, home appliances and entertainment systems, financial institutions, and retail chains, private surveillance, uh, and so on. And what they're doing is uh, working in combination to produce a data deluge uh, that can be combined, analyzed, uh, and acted upon. And a lot of this data ends up in these kinds of uh, rooms or into things like city operating systems. So these are uh, control rooms that are being used to manage various bits of uh, city infrastructure and uh, city uh, services. The one in the top left is probably the most uh, uh, written about it's the control room in uh, Rio de Janeiro that was uh, uh, built really to help manage the city uh, in light of the uh, Soccer World Cup going there and the Olympics uh, and so on and also just general city management and it's pulling together the data from I think it's 32 city agencies and 12 private uh, companies into one control room and and that being used to kind of uh, uh, being combined and used to then manage the city in real time. So they've got kind of traffic data, weather data, environment data, uh, emergency service data, uh, utilities, energy data, and so on, all coming into a, a single uh, place. There's 400 people working there uh, on a 24-7 uh, basis. Uh, the one on the top right is for a smart city development in a suburb in Tokyo, and you can kind of see some of the fine-grained um, uh, data analytics on, on the screen now in terms of uh, being able to monitor what's going on in the city and then manage uh, the services. The bottom left is actually um, the traffic control room from uh, Dublin where data has been drawn from 800 different junctions across the city plus a whole series of from sensors in the, in the road, the inductive loops in the road, plus a whole series of cameras, plus the transponders on the front of all the buses. So we know in real time where a th about a thousand of the buses are, plus people ringing into the radio stations and uh, tweeting and doing other bits and pieces. And then that's being used to uh, alter the phasing in the junctions in real time. So I might go through a traffic light 
and uh, wait 62 seconds to go through it. Somebody else might come along five minutes after me and wait 72 seconds. Somebody five minutes after that and wait 63 seconds and so on. So the whole system is in flux. As the data comes in, the system is reconfiguring the junctions to try and keep the traffic uh, moving. And the one on the bottom uh, right is uh, a, a control room for a single uh, road. Uh, this is the control room for the M25 motorway around uh, London. So that's what it, it kind of takes to keep the traffic flowing on that orbital uh, freeway, if you like, with the freeways interconnecting uh, onto it. So huge amounts of data pouring into these uh, control rooms and then trying to be uh, made sense of to try and manage uh, the city in real time. Um, so, you know, this kind of... Uh, Kind of instrumented city and is leading to a kind of this promise of a new form of uh, smart urbanism where we, we where the data can then flow into things like uh, the economy into uh, managing the environment and managing uh, transportation into uh, new forms of governance into, into living in people so you know new forms of entrepreneurship innovation productivity green energy sustainability creating resilient cities into uh, uh, more intelligent uh, uh, transport systems, multimodal interoperability, efficiency and mobility, into things like open data transparency, evidence-informed decision-making, uh, better service delivery, into things like uh, improving quality of life of citizens, uh, improving safety, security, managing risk, into more informed uh, people that can access this data and be empowered and participate in the city uh, through it. Okay, so that all sounds quite positive, and in many ways it is, but there's also a kind of a dark side uh, to the smart city. If you're kind of uh, managing the city through these technologies and you're also generating these huge quantities of uh, data. So these are a list of some of the ways in which we can kind of think about the perils of the smart city. So, in, you know, the way in which it frames the city is this kind of knowable, rational, a uh, steerable uh, machine as opposed to this very uh, complex, contested, negotiated uh, uh, system, you know, full of imponderables and wicked problems uh, and so on. You know, we can kind of pull these data levers and steer the city as a kind of a, kind of a, a false impression of how cities actually uh, work in practice. Obviously, these, these claims to kind of objective, neutral, non-ideological uh, approaches. This is technology it's, uh, it's uh, it, the data is kind of speaking for itself and so on, as opposed to, um, you know, kind of algorithmic governance, which has kind of biases and other things enrolled into it. It's clearly uh, rolling out kind of very technocratic uh, form of uh, governance. So this is governance by uh, technology and it's promoting a form of solutionism, which is all, all of the issues in the city can be solved through technology. Uh, so we can take those technologies I listed at the beginning and use them to try and fix the various kind of problems in the city. Whereas, of course, some of the problems are probably better served, are better solved through things like policy interventions, changing uh, people's behaviour, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so, and often what these technologies do is they they suffer from um, uh, kind of trying to manage a particular issue as opposed to solving the root problem. So you can take stuff like Waze data and use that to kind of inform people to help them navigate congestion. But the real solution to congestion is not an app, it's to get people out of cars and onto public transport. You, know, you could use, uh, uh, one of my favorite kind of sayings is, is you know, you're not gonna solve homelessness with an app. The way, you know, homelessness is a deep structural uh, uh, problem of inequality and uh, mental health and all other kinds of, uh, of issues. An app might help you manage that more effectively, but it's not actually going to solve the, the root uh, cause. Uh, there's a very strong kind of neo, neoliberal political economy uh, driving uh, part of what's going on here and a kind of a corporatization of governance through kind of public-private partnerships, but also privatization and deregulation and moving um, some of the governance into uh, some of these tech companies to run uh, some parts of our city and uh, I'm not sure that's been really well uh, thought out. What does it mean to hand over um, various ways in which we manage our cities to entities that are driven by, um, by profit effectively? 
Uh, a lot of the technologies seem to work in a way that's a, a historical and a spatial and treat cities as these bounded entities. So by this, I mean, they treat all cities as if they're the same, that they're outside of history, outside of their political economy, their culture, uh, the, the, their own ways of doing governance uh, and so on. So cities are actually quite diverse, but the technologies are actually quite um, hum, 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 homogeneous. Um, they tend to reinforce power relations and, uh, and inequality. So it's who, whose interest do these uh, technologies um, uh, serve and so on. And some quite interesting work looking at uh, smart cities, particularly in places like India, where people are being dispossessed from land, where cities, where the vision of these smart cities includes no slums and it's not very clear where uh, those groups of people are meant to live. These are very much cities for the emerging uh, middle class uh, in India. And then there's a clearly a series of these kind of political ethical effects and also about uh, potential hackable cities. And I'm really going to talk about these last two uh, in detail. So if we think about, uh, go back to this notion of it's producing a lot of data from a lot of different systems across a lot of different domains, then that uh, clearly uh, creates a number of uh, ethical and security uh, concerns. So there's some real concerns around uh, surveillance and the erosion of privacy. Uh, there's concerns around the ownership of the data, who controls the data, how that data flows into data brokers, and then how that data can be uh, sold uh, and combined with other data and so on. How the data can be used in social sourcing and in redlining. So uh, by social sourcing, I mean using the data to kind of predictively uh, profile, well, not just predictively profile, but actually profile people and work out uh, who are the people you want to kind of uh, provide services to and who do you want to exclude? Who do you want to give mortgage to? Who do you want to uh, not? Uh, who do you want to give uh, the tenancy to or the job to uh, and so on? Issue, so this is kind of obviously going into things like predictive profiling, micro marketing around what goods and services. There's a lot of data now showing that there's kind of a zip code lottery going on in terms of uh, dynamic pricing. Um, so I think the Wall Street Journal did um, uh, did a survey where they where they got people in different areas to all buy goods from the same website, but everybody was paying a different price depending on where they lived. Um, so that's kind of uh, going on. Anticipatory governance is 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 if you like the Minority Report side of this. This is the predictive policing. This is trying to use the data to anticipate in advance what people uh, may or may not do and then act on that act on that data. Obviously things like nudge and behavioral change, so using some of this data to try and nudge people to act in uh, different ways. Uh, issues around data security, which I'll come on to, but it's effectively people being able to steal this data uh, and then do other things with it. Control creep is when um, a system that's designed to do one thing starts to do another thing. So an example would be uh, the congestion charge cameras in London that were being used to scan number plates and then work out whether people have paid to actually drive on the roads uh, is, now, is now fully integrated into the kind of counter-terrorism uh, security system. Um, so, so, the control, so the function of the system has kind of crept into a different uh, domain. And I'll talk about the broggy, uh, um, brittle, uh, uh, brittle, hackable, uh, cities towards the end. But if we just focus on one uh, to start with, which is uh, privacy. And what I want to suggest is that privacy is a kind of a multi-dimensional construct. We tend to think of it in a quite narrow way often, that it's about selectively revealing uh, things about ourselves. But that selective revealing goes across a number of different elements. So we can think about identity privacy, which is to protect personal and confidential data to bodily privacy to protect the integrity of the physical person, into territorial privacy to protect uh, personal space and property, into location and movement privacy to protect against the tracking of spatial behavior, into communications privacy to protect against surveillance of conversations of correspondence, and then into transactional privacy to protect against the monitoring of queries and searches and purchases and other uh, exchanges. So and a smart city technology is, and obviously lots of other uh, technologies also uh, that are producing big data tend to infringe on these kinds of uh, privacies. 
And if you're wondering, by the way, what the uh, kind of circle um, down down over here is, this is um, this is the uh, transponder tracks of um, the FBI sort of surveillance planes that fly daily over cities in the U.S. So this is just a track, and basically they have a little Cessna plane up over Cambridge and Boston, and it's basically flying over Harvard and MIT all day, tracking the MAC addresses on smartphones and has infrared cameras and all other kinds of stuff on that. And you can have a look at that for various different cities in the US. They're flying over Philadelphia every day. They're flying over uh, New York every day. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, this is a kind of a taxonomy of privacy. So then, so, so what are the harms of our privacy uh, being broken? So, uh, so there's a number of different ways in which our privacy can be be breached through from surveillance into interrogation, into various forms of aggregation, identification, insecurity, uh, secondary use of the data, so using the data for a purpose it wasn't generated, into exclusion, so using the data to exclude people, so this is social sorting, into things like breach of confidentiality, disclosure, exposure, uh, blackmail, appropriation, distortion, intrusion, and digital inference. So there are a number of different privacy harms that arise from uh, these privacy breaches. So privacy is much more kind of complicated than we, than we think, and the privacy harms are much more uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of more widespread and and have different uh, forms. So you know when people kind of say, well, if you've got not, you know if you have nothing to hide, then there's nothing to worry about. Well, there is in the sense of you know the data can be used in all kinds of different ways uh, in relation. Uh, uh, to your behavior. So we have a kind of a number of processes uh, happening. So the, and I'm just going to kind of run through what I think kind of think is uh, happening and, and why we, you know, there's these kind of issues. So one of them is we're basically seeing an intensification of what we call, might call datafication. So we're getting much more real time data. It's much more exhaustive. It's across a lot more domains uh, and so on. And the capture and the circulation of that data are indiscriminate and they're exhaustive, so they involve all individuals, objects, transactions, uh, and so on. They're distributed, so they occur across multiple different devices, services, and places. They're platform independent, so the data can flow across different platforms, services, and devices. And they're continuous, the data are generated on a routine and on an automated uh, basis. And if we think about uh, that in relation to location and movement data, if I was to go back 30 years and I wanted to track and trace any of you in the room there, I'd have probably have had to hire a private detective and they probably would have had to follow you in person around um, uh, to see what your uh, movements uh, were. It would have been very expensive and very labor intensive. Whereas now your location and movement is uh, being tracked on a routine uh, basis at a very fine granular level. Um, and, it, and it doesn't involve any uh, any uh, kind of people having to wander around after you. So, uh, so these are the kind of different ways in which your movement is presently being tracked. So things like uh, controllable digital high definition CCTV cameras. So things like automatic number plate recognition cameras. Uh, so these can kind of scan the, the plates at the back of the car and so on. It's about 30 million vehicles a day in the UK are captured on AMPR cameras and tracked as they move across, uh, uh, across the landscape there. Uh, increasingly, facial recognition is being installed on um, uh, the CCTV cameras in cities. Uh, so a lot of the cameras in places like Chicago and New York and so on have facial recognition. Uh, increasingly, people are playing around with facial recognition on the body cameras of uh, police and so on. Um, are you still there? Hello? Are you still there? Yeah, we, we lost you. Um, You've lost my video. It's still recording. <laughs> um, you, you, you just can't see me. Shall I just carry on or do you want me to stop and... Um, no, no, let's... Uh, let me think. What was the... Do you all remember the last thing we heard? Oh, there, oh, there I am again. I can see me and you now. Yeah. We can okay. see you. Cle clearly, we can hear you clearly now. Yeah. We just went okay. for about three minutes there. Okay, I, I can see you both. It just dropped off me just now. That was that was all. Okay. Um, 
So if we think about smartphones, so you can track a smartphone in three uh, different ways. So you can do it off the cell mass that the phone's connecting to, you can do it off the GPS on the phone itself, and you can do it off the Wi-Fi points that your phone uh, tries to uh, connect to. Uh, you can use sensor networks to also track phones off their, off their MAC addresses. So in London, it's the bins that track you. So they track you from bin to bin. In Chicago, it's the lampposts that track you. Uh, so they're, they're pulling the MAC address off your phone and then they can um, uh, watch you as you move from effectively from lamppost to lamppost or, or within a store, it might be a uh, beacon so they can see where you're standing in a store and what, what kinds of produce uh, or clothes or whatever it is that you're, that you're looking at uh, and so on. Uh, the Wi-Fi mesh is, is, is again, the, the kind of the, all the Wi-Fi points. So as I, as I move around with my, with my phone, if I've got Wi-Fi turned on my phone, my phone is always trying to connect to a Wi-Fi point. And so it's pinging on to a Wi-Fi to see if it can connect on to one I've connected on in the past. What's interesting about that is, is not only does it tell the Wi-Fi point uh, that I want to connect to it, it also tells the Wi-Fi point every other Wi-Fi network I've ever tried to connect to in the past if I don't uh, get rid of that. So it also gives the history of my uh, movement. You can think about smart card tracking. So if you use things like the Charlie card in Boston or the Oyster card in London, when you tap in and tap out of the system or you tap in and tap out of buildings in the university or on you know, various parts of public transport, again, that's... Uh, kind of tracking you as you uh, move through the network. Obviously things like unique ID transponders on cars for things like automatic road toll, tolling or car parking. And there's various other kinds of staging points. So using an ATM or using your credit card, or if you take a photo, uh, so if I just take a photo now with my, with my phone and upload that onto Facebook, it's also uploading the metadata that's embedded in the photo, which reveals it's, the location where I've taken it. So you can look at somebody's Flickr account and actually see where they've been by looking at the metadata within the photos. And then there's things like electronic tagging and shared uh, calendars. So basically we're, you, we're leaving this whole series of traces as to where, where we are. So my, my phone at the minute is uh, connecting to the Vodafone phone network and it's telling Vodafone where I am about every four minutes. So Vodafone know where I am all the time, basically. And your, and your phone provider does as well. This is the uh, data permissions that can be sought off of, sought by Android apps. This is actually the default setting. So pretty much all the data on your phone is available to app to the people who develop the apps um, to, um, uh, to kind of look at. So, uh, the, the article that this is taken from, the Hein article, is actually about Uber. So this is the data permissions that Uber can uh, access. So it can look at your email log, your app activity, your app data usage, look at your battery, the, the level, the temperature, the voltage of it, look at the device info, your GPS, your phone call log, your SMS logs, your Wi-Fi logs, and all kinds of stuff. So ra rather than your phone fault, uh, being closed by default, it's actually open by default and data is streaming off all the time. So even if your phone is in your pocket and you're not doing anything, there's, photo, there's data streaming off uh, the phone. So what all of this means is, is that you can obviously use this kinds of data and you can kind of deepen uh, inferencing and what's called uh, predictive uh, privacy uh, harm. So obviously, you know, big data and predictive modeling uh, enables a lot of inference beyond the data that's uh, generated. So you can infer info about an individual uh, not directly encoded in the database, but which constitute uh, personally identifiable information, which in turn can create what's called predictive privacy harm. So we don't just have privacy harms, we now have predictive privacy uh, harms, which is a kind of a guesses about who you might be or what you might do. So an example of kind of inferencing would be around co-proximity or co-movements. Uh, so this is often used in kind of counter-terrorism. So you look, at, you look at two phones moving around the city together, and if you know the identity of this phone, and this phone is, I don't know, 
uh, going into mosques and uh, uh, known places uh, where people meet, then you can infer that this phone also might be uh, doing the same thing. So you can use it to infer political, social or religious affiliation through uh, kind of co-proximity. And it's going to kind of also, you can get kind of effects of like tyranny, tyranny of the minority. So Facebook would claim to be able to uh, identify the sexual orientation of 99% of uh, people on Facebook by only knowing maybe 10% of people's sexual orientation. So off the basis of the social networks and the way in which uh, posts are done and so on and tagging is done, a small number of people can actually identify a lot of other people who share the same uh, kind of characteristics and so on. So that's the tyranny of the, of the minority. And it's obviously an inferencing uh, effect. Uh, you can also have these kind of weak anonymization and, uh, and then re-identification issues. So one of the key ways in which uh, the industry would argue that it keeps the data kind of safe is by uh, anonymizing it uh, using uh, pseudonyms or aggregating it uh, or other strat uh, strategies. Because pseudonyms are just a, a unique tag that's used to identify a person or, or a place or a name and, uh, and so on. So uh, so like your social security number, for example, is a, is a kind of pseudonym, a pseudonym. But of course, the code is persistent and distinguishable from others, and it's recognizable on an ongoing basis, which means it can be tracked over time and space and can be used to create individual profiles. So in, in other words, you, you don't actually need to know the identity of the person. You, you still know that person. You can treat them on the basis of... Um, the whole profile that's developed around uh, that uh, identifier. Um, and in fact, so they're, they're no different really from other persistent identifiers such as your social security number, and therefore they can have an effect on your personal, uh, personally identifiable information. So some, some companies talk about uh, anonymous identifiers is a little bit of an oxymoron, especially when the identifier is directly linked with an account with known details. Um, and, and then inference and the linking of the pseudonyms to other accounts and transactions mean it can potentially be re-identified. Re and, and there are a number of companies now that actually specialize in re-identification. They, they try to take data from across different uh, profiles and different systems and put them together and then use that to kind of um, uh, reveal, you know, reveal uh, who people uh, are. Um, the kind of the opacity and automation creates obfuscation and reduces control. This is um, basically that this landscape that's emerging is very complicated and it's quite fragmented. Uh, so in the case of smart city technologies, you have uh, a whole series of different interacting systems run by a whole series of different corporate uh, bodies and uh, state actors and the data can be passed uh, between various different devices, platforms, services, applications, and analytic engines, and they can be shared with uh, third parties. So what you end up with is a kind of like a maze-like assemblage um, where, where it can be very difficult to track um, who is doing what to the data, who is sharing what data, who's producing what derived data, uh, who is using the data in particular ways. So it's very difficult to know who are the data processors and data controllers and if you have a problem, who you go to uh, to find out uh, kind of uh, information uh, and so on. And that kind of opacity and automation kind of undermines the fair information practice principles, which, which are at the heart of privacy regulation uh, in most jurisdictions. It makes it very difficult for individuals to seek access to verify, query or correct or delete data, or even to know who to ask. Um, or to even know how the data being uh, collected about them is being used, uh, or to assess uh, how fair any actions are that are undertaken on the data, or to hold the data controllers uh, to account. So there's a number of kind of issues around that. Um, the data are, are clearly being re, uh, uh, shared and repurposed and used in unpredictable and un unexpected ways. So you know, all of this data has been generated about us, but we don't necessarily know how it's, how it's being uh, used. 
Uh, now, this is where we get into slight differences between uh, the European Union and places like the US and so on. In, in the European Union, and this is why there's been a whole series of issues uh, with American companies around uh, uh, people's uh, privacy around uh, data and about shipping the data backwards and forwards across the Atlantic uh, and so on. In, in the EU, we have a principle of data minimization, which is that the data can only be used for the purpose for which it was generated. And big data breaks that in lots of different ways. And in fact, that's a lot of the ways in which the value is extracted from the data is it's used in uh, to, to, to gain other insights about other, about other things. Now the solution pursued by a lot of companies is to repackage the data um, by de-identifying it. So using pseudonyms or aggregation or creating derived data uh, because it's only the original data set that's subject to uh, data minimization. And it's the repackaged data that can be sold on or repurposed. Uh, um, but that still clearly uh, uh, creates a, uh, a series of issues, particularly when the data can be uh, re identified. Uh, and then obviously there's issues around kind of notice and uh, consent. So uh, one of the, the Two of the key things within fair information practice, practice principles is, is that you, uh, you're you told that data is being collected about you and you're asked to consent for that data to be uh, collected. Now the problem here is, is as, you, as you all know from when you download apps and you get these great big long lists of uh, terms and conditions, uh, it's simply too onerous for us all to wade through all of those legal documents and make decisions about what should and shouldn't happen. And we tend to just click, yes, okay, do whatever you want. Um, uh, so, so there's an issue around uh, actually gaining, gaining the consent because it's kind of meaningless the way that it's done at the minute. But in the case of some of these smart city technologies, it's actually, it's actually quite difficult uh, to do in practice. Uh, so, for example, uh, CCTV cameras, automatic number plate recognition cameras, the MAC address uh, tracking being done by bins and uh, lampposts and so on, uh, uh, various kinds of things around the Internet of Things, that they all take place with no attempt at consent and often with little notification. You know, you couldn't get every bin to ask you whether it's okay that they track you or every camera that's tracking your car as it goes 60 miles an hour down a freeway to ask you permission to track it. Um, so, so there's, you know, the data has been collected with, you with really no notification or consent. And also there's no ability to opt out because the opting out just means you, you don't drive or you don't walk or you don't go in and out of buildings, you don't use public transport uh, and so on. So there's no sense in which a person can selectively reveal themselves they must always reveal themselves and in ways which don't involve uh, consent. Um, and you know, if a person's unaware that data is being generated about them, then it's, then it's impossible for you to discover and query the purposes for which those data uh, are being uh, put. So, so these are the fair information practice principles. So these were initially uh, produced by the OECD in uh, 1980. In the US, it's really only notice and consent that it's boiled uh, down to at this stage. There is uh, issues around security and access, and the others have tended to drop off. And the, sa the same has happened in the U EU now. Only five of these out of the eight, I think, are being used in the EU at, the, at this stage. Um, so choice has kind of gone to a large degree, whether you can opt in or opt out, as I've just explained in relation to some of those uh, smart city technologies. It's very difficult to assess the integrity of, of the data. Uh, big data uh, is often quite messy. Uh, it's kind of, uh, can often be gamed, often have kind of fake data, all kinds of stuff in it. So it's quite uh, difficult to look at that. Uh, obviously the data minimization stuff is kind of going. The accountability is quite difficult if you don't know the, the uh, controller uh, and so on. Um, and then just to move towards uh, finishing up, the other kind of issue around embedding all of this technology into cities and where you get a different set of risks is around the extent to which you can hack the city. So you're, you're taking two very open systems, software and cities, and clunking them uh, together. 
And, you know, we know that software is buggy, it's brittle, it's hackable, it's open to viruses and to malware uh, and to so on. And, and there are now are a whole series of examples of people hacking bits of city infrastructure, things like uh, traffic lights, water treatment plants, uh, pay stations at, uh, 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 at uh, metro stations, um, you know, signaling on uh, train lines, anything that's got software in and is networked is open to be hacked in some way. And, uh, and there are a series of issues that make it vulnerable. So one is kind of weak security and encryption. Uh, this is particularly a problem on legacy systems. And if you ever see, you, sometimes you can see actually in cities, you'll see like a screen, like a real time passenger screen or something, maybe the blue screen of death. And it will show you that it's running Windows NT or Windows XP or something that's no longer supported by Microsoft that went out of business 15 years ago uh, and has all kinds of forever day exploits embedded in it. Um, poor maintenance, a lot of systems having the default username and passwords, the manufacturer defaults, uh, things like large and complex attack surfaces and interdependencies. So something like the Internet of Things involves lots of different technologies across a, a long chain of networks. You need one vulnerable point to gain access to the whole thing. Uh, cascade effects happen like where, if you say you had like a city operating system uh, and you were using it to uh, control your water system, your energy system, your transport and so on. In the same way I can use my computer here, my operating system to look at PowerPoint and Excel and Word and so on. What, what it, by linking the systems together, you can potentially create cas cas cascade effects. So if I gain access to transport, I can gain access to water and then I can gain access to energy and I can gain. So there's very good reasons why you keep things siloed and why you don't connect things up uh, is to protect against these kind of things. And the smart city thing is actually all about breaking down silos and connecting things up. And then there's all kinds of issues around uh, human error and disgruntled employees putting in back doors and taking over systems uh, afterwards. But what does it mean to, uh, uh, for our cities uh, to potentially put these vulnerabilities uh, into them? And then as part of this uh, report that I did for the Taoiseach's office, which is the uh, Prime Minister's office in Ireland, I was asked to kind of say all of what I've just said, basically what all the problems were but I was also asked to produce some solutions. So like, what do we actually do about this? And I kind of came up with a multi-pronged approach, kind of four prongs really. The first one is around the market and around um, industry standards and self-regulation, privacy and security being seen as a competitive advantage uh, and so on. So that people will move to companies who take this stuff more uh, seriously into technological solutions, so better end-to-end -end encryption, access control, security controls, audit trails, backups, and so on, privacy enhancement tools, into policy and regulation, so uh, revisiting those fair information practice principles, updating them for the big data age, looking at things like privacy by design, so rather than your phone being opened by default, it's closed by default, and then you open up what you choose to open up, uh, and security by design. So you basically you build privacy into the system. Security by design is you build security into the system from the get-go. What tends to happen when people are building new technology is they build the technology and then try to layer on, work out how to layer on the security afterwards as opposed to baking it into the system right from the uh, very start. And then a series of kind of governance issues around uh, kind of smart city advisory boards, um, issues around uh, kind of oversight of delivery and compliance. So I think like smart city governance, risk and compliance board. So a good example of this is actually Seattle where, um, where the Wi-Fi points actually were, were tracking people in the city. And there was a bit of an outcry uh, when that was uh, discovered and they've set up a kind of a privacy board, which kind of looks at the different technological systems in the city and uh, looks at the issues in relation to privacy uh, around them. And then the just day-to-day -day stuff like a core privacy security team within uh, the city management, uh, doing actually privacy security assessments 
and things like a computer emergency response team. So if your city is hacked, who responds, who knows what to do uh, to get the systems back and get them back up and running. And that's what a community uh, emergency response team does. And a number of cities uh, now have these. In, in Ireland, we actually have it at a national level. The country is only four and a half million people. So rather than do it for each individual town or city, we just have a centralized uh, system that uh, does that. So that's, uh, so that's it really. Just to kind of conclude, I guess, is um, there's a lot going on in cities at the minute in terms of new technologies coming in, providing new kinds of cities, new uh, forms of uh, management and regulation uh, and delivery of uh, services uh, and so on. And a lot of them offer a lot of benefits to uh, citizens, but they also raise a whole series of kind of ethical uh, questions around the kinds of data that's being produced, the way these systems uh, work to socially sort and predictive uh, profile people, enact forms of anticipatory uh, governance and so on. And, you know, we kind of need to think through those kinds of issues so that we start to produce the kind of cities that we, that we want to live in, as opposed to cities that are effectively just surveillance grids. Uh, and if you want to know uh, more about that, the paper at the bottom uh, was published, I think sometime last year uh, in Philosophical uh, Transactions. And I'll end there.